I'm Jacob Kelly. I'm a regional extension agent down in Southwest Alabama. I'm housed in Mobile. Um, and so we get to play around with citrus and all kinds of different fruit from the rest of you guys. But today I'm gonna to talk about blueberry site selection and preparation of that site. And so uh, hopefully you can see my screen. You see my mouse on my screen, anybody nodding your head? Shit, you can see it? All right, good. I'm gonna be pointing at stuff as we move on. If I can get my slide to move, there we go. All right, um, so number one thing I wanna talk about is things you can consider uh, before you select a slot site or before you get out there. Uh, consider market number one, uh, what's the blueberry market look like? Uh, what's gonna be your market? Uh, are you gonna retail these as a U-pick? Are you gonna wholesale them? Uh, Mexico and South Florida can do some evergreen production as well as those folks down in South America. Um, so um, they can get pretty much uh, in any market they want to. Uh, we can't beat them to market where we're at. Uh, we just can't. So we've got to have a plan on uh, hitting the market after Mexico and Florida and even Southeast Georgia. Uh, you know, they've got Southern high bush there. Uh, and they get a little bit warmer than uh, we tend to get, um, or before we tend to get warm. And so they have uh, a nice crop of blueberries a little bit ahead of us, not too much. But for wholesalers, you're gonna need to find brokers or work directly with wholesalers uh, to get your product sold. Um, you know, wholesalers will only be able to sell their berries for, you know, $1.50, $1.80 to about, $2.40 a pound. Um, so they need to sell a bunch of berries. Whereas you pick, you know, you can get away with selling your, your berries for $2 to $5 per pound, which is about seven to 12 pounds, seven to $12 per gallon. Uh, so the price is better, but you're selling fewer berries. Um, there's a little bit less labor with the you pick because you're getting your customer to come to you. But You've got to have a good location uh, accessible to customers, uh, and you'll have to encourage your customers to come see you at your market, uh, which will be your blueberry field. Um, number two is money. How much money are you willing to invest? Um, that's going to make an impact on which market you're going to be in. Smaller operations can't afford to accept wholesale pricing, so they got a direct market. Um, you pick won't need a harvester or a pack house, which reduces costs significantly, but they'll still need to acquire land, uh, prep that land, install irrigation, get uh, spray equipment, buy the plants, buy the fertilizer and all the other amendments uh, and things like that. So there's, there's going to be a startup cost either way, um, but depending on how much you're willing to put, on, put into it will kind of help you decide where you're, where you're going to end up. Uh, number three is land. Uh, it's one of the most important. Do you have land already or do you need to lease land? Uh, where am I going to put my operation? That can also help determine the size of your operation. Number four is labor. How am I going to get uh, all this work done? You've got pruning, you've got harvest. Those are the two big ones. Then you got these spray schedules. You've got to be out there managing these plants and manipulating them so they uh, react in the way that you want them to, uh, and that takes labor. And so either you're gonna have to get out there by yourself and do this by yourself or with family members, or you're gonna need to get local labor, or you know, if you're big enough, you can investigate H2A labor. Um, but the big question is, how are you gonna do all this work um, that's required? And number five is mindset. Um, you're about to embark on a business venture how serious are you wanting this to be? Is it going to be a hobby after retirement? Um, is this going to be how you make your living? How much of yourself are you willing to put into this? Uh, do you enjoy being outside in the cold and in the heat, sometimes both in the same day in Alabama? Uh, how motivated are you? I myself can be very motivated when it's hot outside, but as soon as you turn the temperature down to cold, I'm done. I'm not getting out there. I don't like wearing pants. I don't like wearing jackets. I don't want to wear a toboggan. I hate being cold. So uh, I'm a lot less motivated to do things when it's cold. So some of this winter pruning, you're not going to catch me doing it. No, I'm going to wait for a warm day. Um, so you need to think about, you know, 
what your mindset, what you're capable of, or uh, and what you what you feel would be the best option for you. Um, and so before you get started spending a bunch of money, kind of keep these things in mind. Um, but when we're selecting a site, the ideal blueberry site, uh, there's sites all over the state of Alabama. We have a pretty good uh, area for growing blueberries, especially down here in South Alabama, um, but all over the state. Um, we're looking uh, for a site that is elevated with a slight so slope. We want elevated land so that cool air and water can drain off our production site um, to prevent both the cool air and the water from settling within the orchard. These plants don't like wet feet uh, and they really don't like cold air, especially during bloom. Uh, we like to keep those uh, flowers a little bit warmer than a freeze. Um, you know, this is uh, especially true if you're in a site without well draining soils or if you plan to grow early cultivars, they're more susceptible to these, uh, you know, late spring frost events that we might have. If you can, you know, get three or four degrees by planting your pl plants on a slope, and all that cool air settles in the bottom, you might save your crop. Um, so hilltops are gonna be, southern facing slopes uh, are gonna be the most ideal location. Hilltops are gonna get colder in the winter due to exposure and uh, they can also be very dry at times. Uh, bottoms and low spots are gonna hold water and that cold air. Um, so we wanna for sure avoid planting in low lying areas. Uh, this is uh, one I always try to drive home to my grandfather. He's convinced that you need to plant all your fruit trees in a creek bottom because uh, that's where the water is. And I tried to explain to him that was a terrible idea, but, you know, I'm just a young gun trying to make it in the world. He planted them and we have not had a crop yet. So just try to avoid these low lying spots. Um, typically, we advise to uh, avoid row, row crop land, a uh, land that was previously uh, growing corn, cotton, soybeans, something like that, um, because this land's been used to grow plants that need a really high pH, uh, and it's gonna cost you a significant amount of money to bring that pH back down to where you need it. Um, these locations may be more likely to have a hard pan as well uh, because of years of tillage and things like that. If they haven't broken up that hard pan, uh, water is kind of kind of sit on uh, that layer of soil and it can cause all types of problems. So it needs to be avoided or broken through before you uh, start manipulating your earth uh, to amend it the way you need it. The ideal location would be a spot that was maybe recently used for pine production. Uh, as long as it wasn't burned too much, uh, the pH should be fine. Pines like uh, acidic soils just like blueberries. And if the soil is already in the right range, uh, that's one less input we need to spend money on. Um, we, we wanna know uh, what the soil is like before we do anything to it. And ideally before we purchase or lease the land, uh, we'd wanna know the attributes of the soil. So um, we're gonna be looking to see if it's well-drained. We wanna know the soil type, texture, the depth of that soil before you get to the parent material. So we've got our, you know, we'll call it topsoil. And then uh, our parent material is usually when you start seeing it change colors. Uh, and I know up there in central Alabama, you dig down and you got this really nice topsoil and then you get to a clay layer. And that's what I'm talking about is uh, the parent material. Um, and you'll need a good water source nearby. This could be a lake or a pond that's fed by a stream. It could be well water. Um, water is important for these plants to grow and develop properly. Um, and you need uh, plenty of water per, to, to produce high quality uh, blueberries. The amount of water you have will also help you determine the size of your irrigation and what type you have. More water is needed for micro irrigation than drip irrigation. So if you got a lot of water, uh, you may consider some micro sprinklers. Um, but uh, if you don't have a lot of water, if you're only getting you know 200 gallons per hour or something like that, then uh, you, you know you need to throw out the drip irrigation. Um, and you may also need water uh, water for frost protection, and that's going to be a lot of water um, that you're putting out. And you 
you start uh, putting that water out before it freezes and you don't turn it off until after the freeze and the ice starts to melt. So that's a lot of water um, that you're throwing out there. So you'd have to be prepared to be able to throw that much water out. Uh, and that would only be necessary during bloom and uh, especially with Southern high blueberries uh, or early rabbit eye blueberries like Climax or Titan. Uh, and we also want a place that's got good sun exposure because uh, sun exposure is critical to flower development. Um, if these plants get, can't get full sun, they cannot have a full canopy of flowers. Uh, and the more flowers we have, the more fruiting potential we have. And the more fruit we have, the more money we can make. Um, so um, if you find a site, we've got our site selected, we got to come up with a plan. Uh, you can't just go out there and start sticking plants in the ground. Um, we've got to have a plan. I like to draw things out. I'm a very visual person. I really need to see everything um, on paper so I can visualize it out on the property. Um, and so we want to include every detail we can. Uh, we may need to plan our orchard around existing buildings, wells, ponds, power lines, uh, other things that may be already present on the property, fences that we don't want necessarily need to move, um, you know, cell phone towers. People have all kinds of crazy stuff on their properties uh, that you might need to work around or move. Um, so we need to figure out a plan for those. We want to figure out row orientation. Uh, where roads are going to be, turnaround, staging areas. Uh, I heard once from a wise blueberry grower that you need to spend about 10 times the amount of time planning and prepping for your orchard than you do uh, for anything else, selecting plants, uh, you know, getting that equipment to grow and all that irrigation. You need to plan 10 times the amount before you start dealing with the, the actual plant material. Um, so our land is our foundation. That's what we're going to grow our plants on, just like our houses. These plants need to have a strong uh, and well manicured foundation um, so that and it needs to be well thought out so that they can grow and produce uh, these giant and wonderful tasting blueberries for us so we, that we can all make a little bit of money. Uh, slope is going to be important. Uh, Short and steep slopes like the ones in this picture are a little too steep for production and may need to be manipulated to facilitate water runoff. Um, if you have a slope that's too, sleep, too steep and you plan on it, you're almost guaranteed to have issues with water runoff uh, in one direction or another. Um, you can see here that these rows were planted with the slope um, which makes this site, site like a water slide. Uh, that water starts at the top of the hill and it gains speed, and who knows how fast it's coming when it rolls off onto that road. Um, and what's not in the picture is I missed it. Uh, when I was taking the picture, there's a gully, uh, a small little gully to the right-hand side that's been, required, been requiring attention and patchwork, um, and we want to try to avoid that. This grower wasn't here during the establishment of this orchard and wishes he could go back in time to remedy this headache before it became a headache. Um, and there are many things we can do and I'll get into some of that uh, a little bit later. But if you're in a situation like this, um, the best way to handle this is to, uh, before you ever even lay pipe for irrigation or purchase plants, you need to move that dirt around and decrease the slope if possible. Um, you could also terrace this slope to slow down the water uh, and allow it to drain through the soil and not the surface, not run along the surface. Or you can plant your rows perpendicular to the slope to kind of slow that water down as it hits each row. It's going to settle in and ideally it will slow down and percolate through the soil and not run off and carry any of your topsoil or any of that stuff like that with it. Um, but even if you do orient your rows perpendicular to a slope, you still may get a washout. Um, here you can see that this grower has laid out concrete and rock uh, to try to keep this situation from getting worse. Um, if you have a spot that you know water will drain through, plan for it. Um, that could be something as simple as putting berms up to kind of deflect that water and uh, take it where you want it to go or uh, laying a small concrete ditch with a retention pond at the bottom of it. I've seen that and it works effectively. Uh, the water does go racing down, but it's on concrete and it lands in that pond uh, and doesn't hurt anybody or erode any of the land. 
and you're able to reapply that water to the orchard. Um, and so you, you'll be able to get, you know, retain some of that water on the property, which is always good. Uh, but we want to manage our water so that it goes where we want it to and not necessarily where it wants to, even though it's a very strong force uh, and hard to combat. As a rule of thumb for any crop, not just blueberries, but anything, uh, we want to start small and get the hang of growing our crop. Uh, we, I get calls all the time from people um, that have gone in and they planted five acres of blueberries and had never grown anything before in their life and they're running into a bunch of problems. Um, you know, that could have been prevented if one, you call extension first. Remember folks, we're free. Uh, don't forget that your tax dollars pay for us to come out and consult you and help you and get you off on the right track so you can grow your crops and make money. So don't forget about us. Give us a call before you get crazy with it and start spending money and we might be able to save you a buck or two or at least put you off on the right uh, the right foot. So give us a call and start small. Um, you know, it can be really overwhelming starting uh, a farm and, you know, you put a lot of money into it and all that. So we want to master our skills, start small, and then move forward with our operation. Uh, you'll want to plant, you'll want to, excuse me, divide your pr production areas up. Um, before you really get into irrigation and soil amendments, um, you'll wanna decide where irrigation and road is gonna go later on, but, uh, and things like that. But these are, you know, two very different blueberry orchards. The one on the left is a larger orchard uh, and that mechanically harvests. And on the right, we have a smaller orchard that is a U-pick on the front side and machine harvested on the back side. Um, and he's got a little bitty, uh, He's got a tractor and he pulls an over the row uh, harvester and it works really well for him. But those harvesters can be quite expensive. So if you wanna go that way, it is a lot nicer. You don't have to have uh, labor or worry about you know people on your property, but they're very expensive. But both of these orchards have divided the orchard into different production areas. Lots of times these production areas will divide themselves because of planting times, uh, you may start out with one acre of blueberries and add more later on. Um, if you want to plant everything at once, you're going to need to divide some of this out based on cultivars in, in that area or that you want to plant in that area, maybe irrigation zones, the terrain, space you have, things like that. Uh, you know, and typically our main irrigation lines are going to run along or underneath our roads on the property. And uh, I'm, I'm certain that Neil covered some of that last week when he was talking about irrigation. So I don't wanna get deep into irrigation or setting plants or anything like that because we got other folks for that. Um, but it's during this time you can decide to set aside space for staging areas and turnaround areas. Um, and so let's take a little bit closer look at what I'm talking about. This is that same picture of that orchard earlier. Um, and this is what I mean when I say staging areas. Uh, the first area we're gonna talk about is a staging area for plant material. Depending on the size of your operation, you may need to, a place to store plants before putting them in the ground. And so you need to set up an area that looks like this ahead of time that's got, uh, that's ready for these plants when they get there. The location is close to the road, it's flat. It's been supplied with overhead irrigation for the plants when they arrive. So we can go ahead and start watering them. Um, they're probably going to be stressed uh, just from the moving around and getting on, in and out of the truck and all the handling and things like that. A little water will go a long way. Um, and this area is big enough that a tractor trailer can get in here, drop off the plants, turn around and get out effectively. Um, and it gives you room to put these plants out in a location within the orchard where these plants can hang out until you're ready to put them in the ground. You don't have to worry about putting them in a barn or you know, in the way of anything, they've got a designated location. And after your initial planting exercise, you can make this area a garden, you can plant a pollinator area. I know all the new gap stuff, they're wanting uh, more pollinator habitat. Um, that's a, you know, you could turn this location into a pollinator habitat, or you could just leave it as a staging area for future endeavors. Um, you know, whatever uh, meets your needs. Uh, next, we've got another staging area uh, up here on the north side. And uh, what I wanna talk about with this area is having plenty of room to turn around any equipment you may be using. So 
the smaller your equipment, the less turnaround space you may need. Um, but you need to be able to turn your harvesters around, your trucks, your tractors with trailers on them and spray equipment and pruning equipment and all that. Um, you may need to move personnel around and things like that. You've got to have space to turn around at the end of the rows. Uh, or you, you might be backing up all of them or tearing something up or trying to make a turn too sharp and tearing up some irrigation. I've seen it all and I've done a lot of it. I've definitely torn up my fair share of irrigation with lawn mowers uh, and not having enough place to turn around. Um, so think about that uh, as you're planning this. Whatever you have, you need to facilitate the turning of that equipment to so set aside space for it. And the last area I'm gonna talk about is not far from that area. Uh, it's a little bit bigger. Um, you notice that last area um, was different, differently oriented. This last one, this grower used it um, to park tractor trailers uh, containing his pine bark mulch. Uh, and he, this was his staging area for his pine bark. So for larger operations, you're, it's gonna be necessary to have room to store some of these amendments or things you might be using. You might need to store a tractor trailer that's going to sit there until you empty it um, uh, and things like that. And they need to have areas that they can drop off, uh, leave loads, leave trailers, turn around and get places. And so this place is, uh, you know, just big enough for that. It runs alongside the road, not a turnaround uh, spot. It's just an extra area out of the way of your production area. You still bring a sprayer through there, even if you had a big pile of mulch sitting there. So the point is of all this is to allow your, yourself some space if you can afford it. Um, you know, if you plan these uh, in advance, you won't have to, uh, you know, try to clear some land after you've already got plants in the ground later on. So it will cost you more to get into production the more you rush. So think, if I wanna do this next year, it's gonna cost me way more than if I just wait a couple of years and just do it step by step. So instead of growing organic matter, uh, you're going to be buying it by the truckload if you want it to happen fast. Um, so try to take at least a year or two before you ever put plant blueberry plants in the ground to manage the site and the soil. Um, because what you do now is going to impact your uh, blueberry orchard for its entire life, for its entire lifetime. So we need to go ahead and set that foundation and get everybody off on, uh, you know, at a good start. Um, so that we can be profitable and not have to try to fix things or halfway do something later on. This also gives you the opportunity to learn the land if you're leasing it and new to it. Um, and it's an opportunity to find those spots that may need a grade adjustment. You know, even if you got a cover crop, you, uh, some problem areas will pop up and you'll be able to notice those uh, and you can adjust the grade or um, you might realize, all right, this, this spot's too wet. Uh, you know, it, even if it, even it, it, it is on a slope, but it's still too wet. I can't plant here. Um, so maybe you leave that, that spot open uh, and don't plant on it. But remember, cover cropping's your friend. Cover cra crops add much needed organic matter to your soil. Organic matter uh, will help sandy soils hold, hold more nutrients and water and help our heavy soils drain better. Uh, so it doesn't matter what kind of ground you have, find a cover crop that meets your needs and stick it out there um, to protect that ground you have. Uh, you need more organic matter in your life, uh, especially since our state has less than 1% organic matter throughout the state. I mean, you're not going to find very much organic matter in our native soils. Um, and so we need to put it there. So take your time if you can. Uh, at, a, at about a year to six months before we order plants, we need to do a soil test. Uh, we need to have the soil in the correct pH range. Um, and that's one of the most important things we can do to um, take care of our plants uh, before we stick them in the ground is getting that pH right. If the pH isn't right, you'll uh, lose not only time, but you'll end up losing money. Uh, plants may become stunted, lack productivity, and in some cases they can even die if they're in the wrong pH for too long. Uh, so pH is one of the most important things out there you need to make sure is correct. Uh, if it's between, you know, getting the pH right or buying fertilizer, get that pH right. Um, there's always nitrogen in the soil and there's always these nutrients. They may be low, but if that pH is right, 
the plant can break those um, break those uh, bonds of that nutrient on the soil colloid and use utilize it. Um, so pH is very important. Um, then we wanna add organic matter. If it's feasible, pine bark or peat moss are great amendments to add when planting blueberries. Uh, these are gonna help with drainage and water holding capacity, as well as nutrient retention. Uh, and so plant your cover crop, protect your investment and keep the soil where you need it. I'm gonna talk quickly about rows. Um, ideally, we plant everything within the rows oriented north to south. Um, Orient rows this way will help harvest more sunlight than orienting rows other directions. However, if you're planting on a slope, um, you're gonna have to weigh your options here. You might want to orient those rows perpendicular to that slope to slow down water as it rolls down the hill uh, to a lower to lower ground. So doing uh, manipulating your rows, you know, can save you headache as far as water, water runoff later on. Um, We'll need to loosen up the soil at the planting uh, area so the plant roots have plenty of space to grow. Uh, using, using a rototiller, a spade, a uh, disc, something like that is going to help loosen up that soil for the planting area. Um, and uh, you also might want to add more pine bark or peat moss at this time. Um, a little bit more, more organic matter is kind of uh, one of your last few opportunities. So make sure that peat moss is moist when you put it in the planting hole. If it's dry and you put a clump in there and then plant the plant on top of it, that peat moss is gonna rob your plant of water for a little while until it uh, is imbibed with water. Uh, so you need to make sure you at least get a little moisture on that peat before uh, you stick it in the ground. A lot of times um, you can do that as you're laying it out. Um, and I'm not gonna get into planting too much because Chip's gonna tell us everything we wanted to know and more about that. So I'm not gonna dive into that too deep, but we also wanna plant our, uh, we also wanna mound up our beds if we can to help with drainage uh, away from our plants and to slow water running downhill. Six to 18 inches is adequate for bed height. However, if you're using a harvester uh, or a mechanical harvester, you may need to make sure that it can get through there and effectively do its job. If the bed's too tall, it may, it may cause problems with that harvester. Um, mulching is essential for blueberry production uh, and especially during establishment. Organic mulches are effective weed barriers uh, that add organic matter, enhance plant growth, cool the soil in warm temperatures, uh, help retain moisture and improve nutrient availability. So mulching is critical to establish those young plants that could be choked out by weed competition. I've seen this a lot of times where you go out and check out a farm, they've got, they have a problem with weeds and they don't have any kind of barrier uh, down uh, to prevent the weeds from coming up in their crop. So it causes a lot of problems later on uh, with production. Pine bark mulch is the industry standard uh, in blueberry production in our state. Um, this is because it's readily available and easy to find. Uh, because the demand is high for pine bark, we use it in nursery substrates and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it can be anywhere from twenty to thirty-five dollars a yard, and so we're talking, I don't know, two thousand um, dollars for an eighteen-wheeler load, and uh, and that's just depending on the type of pine bark you get and where you're getting it from. Uh, pecan shells are not commonly used in the industry, but are a byproduct of the pecan industry. And uh, they usually don't have a home to go to, so they sit out next to these shell implants uh, or they dispose of them. Um, so during my undergraduate uh, studies, I got the opportunity to take over a study that was managed by Ashley Hoppers, who is a rock star extension agent in Georgia. And she was looking at to see if there was any negative impacts from using pecan shells as a pine bark substitute for mulch on blueberries. Long story short, uh, we found that using pecan shells was comparable to using pine bark mulch. So pecan shells can cost anywhere from $25 a truckload to free a truckload. Uh, it just depends on where you get them from uh, and how uh, fast they need to get rid of them but most of our shellers would be happy for someone to come by and pick up their leftover shells. Um, so that option's out there. 
Um, Organic mulches will have to be replenished uh, sometimes annually as they decompose. Um, but recently, some Georgia growers have been working with geo, geo textile fabrics as mulch. Um, and these mulches are expensive and you have to have a, a machine to put them out and all that. Um, but they suppress weeds really well and they last for several years and you don't have to replace them quite as often. Um, you know, 10 years, I think, is what everybody's getting out of them. And so um, that could be an option for you if that's what you want to do. Um, I've got to hurry up because I'm running out of time, but a, a mulch spreader can really save you some time and labor. So I do recommend, especially if you're using organic mulches, to invest in some kind of mulch spreader, um, you know, that you can pull behind the tractor, fill up with your mulch, and it shoots it out of chute. You can have a guy there with a the rake spreading everything out, making it pretty. Um, it's a good time saver if you've got the fun for it. But real quick, I want to talk about some little things uh, that I had never thought about until recently. I took a trip um, to uh, Wild Fork Blueberry and um, they uh, pointed some things out that I had never even thought about before. So I thought that all of you would like to learn about it. Uh, so the image on the left is a power pole lined up perfectly between two rows. Um, so this caused all kinds of problems uh, because of where it's located. What really should have happened here is these two rows should have been shortened a little bit so that there's plenty of space to facilitate equipment use, sprayers, turnaround, lawnmowers, all that stuff. Um, and because uh, you're not going to move the power pole. So maybe shorten those rows. You're not going to lose, uh, you know, that much money off of not planting, you know, 10 plants or so. Um, but if you look closely, that power pole has been hit a few times. Whoops. Um, on the right, you see that uh, they planted these plants right up on the side of the road in the ditch uh, that runs alongside it. So the weeds on the road side of the plants, uh, they got to be weed eated, hand pulled, hand sprayed. Um, you know, you can't get your sprayer on that road to spray those weeds. Um, not to mention the fact that the harvester's got a teeter on a small strip of land between that ditch and the blueberry plants. That seems pretty sketchy to me. I'd be real hesitant to mess around with it, but you know, these guys drive these harvesters all day, every day. So they're a little bit better at it than I am. But what should have happened here is uh, that this row should have been left out. Um, this would have given adequate room for machinery. Um, and Edgar's trying to interrupt me. Um, <laughs> but would have uh, maybe provided another staging area or, or pollinator production area, whatever you want to use it. Or just because we can put plants there doesn't mean we always should. All right, so this is something to be aware of and I'd never even thought about it until it was brought to my attention. Um, this picture is facing north. So the east is on our right, west is on our left. We're looking, um, if you look really closely, you can see that these plants are leaning to the left. Uh, to the west. Um, that's because on the east side of these plants, there's a wood line. And I'd say it's maybe 15 or 20 yards away from these blueberry plants, maybe even more. Um, but these plants are reaching for the sun that doesn't shine on them until late morning. And so because of this, um, they have developed a, a swagger is what I'm going to call it, but the, a, a leftward lean. And so this may not seem like a big problem and, it, and it's not a huge one, but it can cause issues with machine harvest and machine pruning, especially the pruning. One side of this plant, the west side is gonna get heavily pruned and that right side on the east side is hardly gonna get pruned at all. Uh, and so this is gonna put most of your fruit on that west, west side because new shoots are gonna come out after your summer pruning uh, and you're gonna get a lot of fruit on that west side and it could overload that one side of your harvester. Uh, not a big deal, just something to be aware of and think about. And here's another good one. Uh, I really like this one. Uh, look at this valve box right here. See how it's within the row? It's in the row, not out in the road or in between the rows. Um, so this is done to keep that box safe and mainly the lid safe um, from equipment. Heavy machinery, trucks, pickers, lawn mowers, all that stuff will shatter these lids and then you'll be left with a hole with a valve in it. The valve box is out of the way, easily accessible, um, and just where you need it to be uh, out in that field. So that's some food for thought. Just when you're thinking about planting these things out, 
maybe think about putting those valve boxes within the row uh, so you don't have to worry about running over them with equipment and things like that. But I've gone over my time. But uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions y'all might have about establishment uh, or any general questions about blueberries if you got them.